So I guess really what, uh, what government need is, needs is basically good, robust information so that we can all feel confident moving forward. They need to have confidence that the decisions they make are, are right. Therefore, they need good, robust scientific and engineering information to inform those decisions. And you also need a fairly simple process so that everyone can understand why those decisions are being made. And we also need certainty of outcome as soon as practical. And I think we've all been frustrated, I guess, at the time that it's been taking to get that information together. And we can talk about that with questions later. In terms of the land, land performance data, um, a number of things have actually informed us on that. Um, we had mapped around 38,000 properties from the 4th of September event as of the 22nd of February. And of course, after the 22nd of February, we had to go back to square one and remap every single property again. So we've now mapped over 100,000 properties in Canterbury in terms of land damage to look at the relative severity of that damage. And of course, we've just restarted now in some areas that have got additional damage from the 13th of June and of course even from, from earlier this week. We've also mapped the lateral spreading damage and we'll show you some maps that we've got of that. But more particularly, um, we've actually been running LIDAR surveys over the Canterbury area. In fact, these have been undertaken since around 2003. And what these are, these actually use light rather than radio waves like radar and with, um, with laser pulses. So they can get an accurate determination of the actual ground level in terms of its absolute level. So we can compare what the levels were like after the earthquake compared with what the levels were like before the earthquake. And that is important information in terms of going forward. After the 4th of September, we were concerned at the extent of the liquefaction and land damage, which we mapped, and that was produced, of course, in the press. What we thought was extensive then was just nothing compared with, of course, what um, Canterbury's experience subsequent to that. Of course, a lot of these areas also reliquified um, from the 13th of June event, but generally they're in the same areas as we see here. So it's really the comparison between those two. About 10 times more land area affected by liquefaction this time around. And if we look at the cracking damage, you'll see that the cracking tends to be concentrated around the Avon River. And this isn't surprising because um, lateral spreading needs a free face and the rivers provide the best free face around because most of the other land is, is so flat relative to the, the banks and the river itself. So very high concentrations were lateral spreading around those, uh, those suburbs. We've also been informed by the, the building damage. Now this has come from the Earthquake Commission who do the assessments um, up to 100,000 plus GST on the houses and of course they also insure the land. Um, but also the private insurers who basically cover the, the entire building damage. And also the infrastructure damage reported by the councils, particularly Christchurch City and, uh, and Waimakariri have been working very hard to actually determine just the extent of the damage of the infrastructure because we need to know that because if things have to be rebuilt or basically uh, walked away from, we need to know in fact what those costs may be. This is the map of the infrastructure damage. We see that, in fact, those blue areas largely unaffected. So most of the areas not affected by basically loss of services. In the orange areas there, we've got either partial or, or, or moderate damage to those services. But some areas where you've got the red around the Avon and some of the suburbs there, you'll see that those services have been completely damaged um, and will need to be completely repaired. If we look at the building damage, if you look at the red dots and the black dots, they really show where buildings probably needed to be rebuilt, that they were beyond economic repair. So that was after the 4th of September, and uh, that was a large number then. If we look at the comparison between 4th of September and 22nd of February, you'll just see the extent of not only just building damage, but if you look at the, the black and the red, very high concentrations in particular areas. We go back out to the, the, the blues and, and greens, those really are, sh are showing that there's not a huge amount of damage, sort of up to 20% of the building probably is, uh, is damaged in terms of its repair cost. The key factors that have basically informed, uh, I guess, the analysis in terms of the land are the land level changes, and this is important. 
there's been a lot of ground settlement. The ground has literally sunk. What this does is actually reduces the thickness of the crust. And by the crust, what we mean is the depth between the ground surface and the groundwater table. This then increases the severity of liquefaction damage under ground shaking, but it also reduces the ability of the ground to actually support buildings. The other one, of course, is, as we mentioned, is the lateral spreading, which is the land moving sideways, as I say, particularly concentrated around the waterways. NZ aerial mapping and, and, and LINS and GNS, but particularly, um, I guess, GNS and LINS have been looking at all the benchmarks and what's been happening in terms of the benchmarks in Canterbury. Now, this was after the 4th of September event. What you'll see is that it's been almost a clockwise rotation of a lot of those benchmarks. So the yellow um, lines are basically vectors in terms of vector movement horizontally, and we have the red showing vertical. So it was largely a horizontal displacement, but this clockwise shift, some areas showing quite large vertical displacement, that would be largely as a result of probably liquefaction. Similarly, the um, particularly long yellow markers there, again, probably a result of lateral spreading and liquefaction locally rather than the benchmark regional movements. We then see what happened after the 22nd of February event. And you can see there's been a general shift of all the benchmarks laterally to the southeast. They've all basically shifted in that direction. What we also show there is that we've got quite a large vertical component on a lot of those benchmarks. They've actually gone down. They're the red lines. And we also show some which are green. That's actually benchmarks which have actually gone up. So as you're probably all aware, the Port Hills have gone up around 400 mils and the plains themselves have gone down around 200 mils. And this is a regional shift. As well as the regional shift, you've got local shifts. If we look at the LIDAR data and we look at the comparisons, this shows us that in areas, for example, in Horseshoe Lake Burwood, we've got a drop of the land around a metre to a metre and a half. Again, the, the blue is showing that that land has gone up and the yellow showing that land has gone down. If we look at that in absolute level, you can see these are in terms of both Christchurch City datum and, uh, and uh, Littleton vertical datum, and you can see the blue areas are really the areas that are low-lying. So these areas are more low-lying than they were. We put some criteria on the recovery and it's really the area-wide land damage of this requires engineering solutions rather than individual solutions. When you look at area-wide solutions, these aren't going to be timely or particularly cost-effective. The other, I guess, criteria to inform, which is what Sarah have been looking at closely, is the health and well-being of the residents. So not just basically in terms of, of the timing and the cost, but also what's this doing to the people. Again, can repairs be undertaken on an individual property basis? And as I said, the time for repair, the disruption to the residents in terms of that time. And you also look at cost escalations, if things are going to take years to actually um, be repaired, just what that's going to do to actually the, the cost. So we have basically put the Canterbury area into four zones. Green, the go zone, and there are more than 100,000 properties in this zone. The orange, which is a hold zone, which has around 9,000 properties. We have the red zone, where we have about 5,000 properties, which cannot be rebuilt on in a reasonable time frame. And we have white, which is unzoned, where mapping is still in progress. A lot of this land is because of the 13th of June event. We've had to go back and just look at the land damage from that, particularly up in the Port Hills, where that caused significantly more damage. And also, we are waiting on LIDAR information to see what um, the ground has actually done as a result of the 13th of June event. So the green zone, no significant land issues, and the insurers can continue with their claim settlement process. DBH guidelines are being updated, and they will inform basically on the rebuilding required there. Specific design may well be required, and we also need to take account of the risk of, of aftershocks in terms of the rebuild. 
Within the green zone, there may be some isolated areas of severe damage, but again, that can be handled on the normal insurance claim settlement process. The orange area, there are many buildings um, may be uneconomic to repair, and the extent of the infrastructure damage is still unclear in that area. Council are still having to look and see just um, what the damage is. A lot of this needs to be dug up before you can actually sort of see just, uh, just what's going on. And certainly the new damages of the 13th of June means that we do have to look at those areas again. And we would expect that once we do that, these areas will be reclassified either green or red. The red zones are where the land has been extensively damaged. Most buildings are uneconomic to repair. There's a high risk of future damage and the infrastructure needs to be completely rebuilt. And land repair will be difficult. And we have the white areas which are basically what we call unzoned. Port Hills is an example of this where because of the extensive further damage, we're having to go back and remap and reassess just what the uh, extent of that is underway. I guess this is the general map that we've come up with. This is showing Christchurch City within its boundaries um, going down uh, to the southern area there uh, where we basically are still having to do more mapping um, and we take into uh, basically County of Kaipoi um, ward within Waimakariri district. And there we can see the areas of, of green which are extensive and red and orange. If you look at those more closely, we can see in the northern suburbs, northern suburbs of Christchurch and southern of Waimak, you've got uh, some red areas, but generally these are hold areas where further information will be required before we can make an informed decision. Within Christchurch City, in terms of the eastern suburbs, I think we can see really the areas there that probably aren't certainly um, unexpected, certainly as far as the residents are concerned and certainly most of you journalists have been out into those areas since the, the 4th of September as well. Where to from here? As I say, rebuilding methods in the green will be informed by DBH and as GNS remind us, the timing of the repairs and rebuilding needs to take into account the potential for damaging aftershocks. We're still in the Canterbury earthquake sequence we hope we're going to be out of that fairly, fairly soon, but we don't know. But with ongoing time, we will actually become better informed. The probabilities will fall away and we will get out of the sequence at some stage. Ongoing mapping in the Port Hills. Again, just um, to show the, uh, the yellow is basically where there is um, areas of damage and the blue or purple areas there are where you've got rock source areas which have basically been firing a lot of the rocks down onto the residents below and some of the cliff tops which have also been failing under these extremely high earthquake accelerations. As well as the rock fall and the, and the cliff collapses we have a lot of retaining wall damage up in the Port Hills. Because it's moderately steep, generally people have carved out flat bits of land by either cutting or filling and retaining or not those cut and fill slopes. Extensive land damage in terms of retained structures up in the Port Hills. Thank you very much.